everybody, just a quick message from yours truly. As we head into the weekend, I have an amazing announcement for you guys. So I am personally hosting a nutrition masterclass. Now, this is not an uh, open masterclass for just anybody. A group of high-level executives and entrepreneurs have asked me to put on a masterclass specific to helping you perform at your best, feel at your best, ultimately look at your best, and how that all intersects with longevity. There's so much conflicting information, conflicting data out there that ultimately is causing confusion. And this really small take group of gentlemen have uh, asked me to give my time. And so I have a few tickets remaining on their discretion to allow a select group of high achievers into this group. Now, if you're someone who is already successful in what you're doing, you see the value in, in optimizing for time and working with someone who's done this for 25 years, literally spending 25 years looking for the 1% opportunities that existed in every different facet of nutrition, training, stress optimization, cardiac function, aerobic fitness. I'm going to teach you guys exactly how you need to be approaching your nutrition, thinking about your nutrition, and ultimately making it more effective, how to optimize for time. If that sounds interesting to you and you're an executive, athlete, or entrepreneur over the age of 35, then I will uh, offer you the opportunity to apply for an invitation. As I said, I have a very small number of spaces available. So if this sounds like you and it sounds like it can be a great fit and you're committed to changing your body, ultimately optimizing your lifestyle now, head over to muscleintelligence.com slash tickets. And I look forward to seeing you there. Again, as I say, you'll have to fill out a quick application and either myself personally or my team will review it. Make sure you're the right candidate for it and we will send you a ticket. Make sure you're available this Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, if you're not available, please don't bother to apply and take a ticket from somebody else. We just want people who are absolutely committed to being the best version of themselves in 2023 and optimizing nutrition, whether it be for muscle building, for being lean, healthy, and muscular, for longevity, all of those topics are going to be covered and a whole lot more in this really concise, action-packed masterclass this weekend. We look forward to seeing you there. One more time, muscleintelligence.com slash tickets. Today's podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Bioptimizers, an incredibly longtime sponsor of this podcast because they have amazing products that you continue to buy because they work. I think every one of my clients is certainly on mass zymes. I take that consistently every day. I like to take a lot. I like to take five in the morning on an empty stomach and then three to four with each of my high protein containing meals. This really help, helps me extract the protein from the meat and the ultimate protein sources that I'm consuming rather than just eating it and assuming that my body's going to utilize it. I want to make sure that my body can digest, absorb, and assimilate all these highly cost, uh, high cost proteins and high quality proteins that I'm consuming. It's not just about what you consume. It's about what your body can digest, absorb, and assimilate. So I highly suggest you head over to bioptimizers.com and use the code muscle10 to get 10% off. That's B I O P T. I-M-I-Z-E-R-S, by optimizers.com. Use the code muscle10. They've also, also got an incredible suite of incredible products from p 3 om to support digestion, Capex to support people on a ketogenic diet. And you guys all know my incredible, uh, how much of an incredible fan I am of their product, um, Magnesium Breakthrough, which is seven different magnesium chelates. Um, and they're also expanding their line consi consistently every year with research and doing incredible products. You guys get hooked up with 10% off all of their products. Head over to buyoptimizers.com and use the code MUSCLE10. So what I think I maybe do very well, what our coaches do exceptionally well, is see obstacles before they come, provide solutions so that you can have the fastest direct path to your end result. So nutrition is the topic of conversation today. One thing I wanted to talk about before we get into nutrition this goal setting and, and how to become a goal achiever and, and how to ultimately become a goal killer. So many crushes goals. And it's this mindset of no matter what, I will follow through. And I don't think that's common, is it? I think there's, there's so many, you know, so many people in life who will experience a setback or experience a roadblock or maybe even a hard day and give up. I encourage you guys to sit with yourself before these things happen, right? This is what journaling is about. This is what, you know, meditation can be about. It's anticipating challenges, anticipating hard days, bracing for impact and deciding ahead of time that when those things come up and not if they come up, but when they come up, how you're going to respond. 
you know, one of the things that, uh, for better or worse, made me a successful bodybuilder was I was pretty stubborn, man. I was pretty hard headed and I just wouldn't take no for an answer. Right. I just didn't know what stopping meant. And I, I don't know if that was at certain times, maybe a, a blessing and certain times, maybe a curse, but it was this mindset of I'll find a way. Right. I don't know how, but I'll find a way. I encourage each and every one of you to take that mindset on with you. There's no such thing as I can't. It's like, okay, I don't know how, or I don't know how yet. And this stands for everything in your life, doesn't it? This stands for your finances, for your relationships, for parenting, for your body, for literally any goal that you're setting is like, I have no idea how I'll get there, but I won't can stop. Right. That's it. And, and the, the, one of the keys that I like to push with my team is enjoy it, right? So when we're, go under, when we're go undergoing stress as a team or as a business or as a person, there is an opportunity, as much as this sounds a little sadistic, um, in, to enjoy the pro, to enjoy the discomfort, right? To enjoy the, the stressful times because you know you're getting stronger. And when you can shift your mindset away from like, oh man, this really sucks, to, oh man, this really sucks. Hell yeah, bring it on. I can take it, right? I, I bring on more. Then it's a completely different mind flip, right? It's like, oh, I'm moving toward this thing on purpose. Like, oh, now I'm in control. Now I'm a creator rather than a victim. And I think that's important for you guys to acknowledge in life is wake up every day realizing that obstacles are there for a reason. Move head first toward them. Don't move away from them, right? If, if something is an obstacle to you, it's because you're not strong enough to, for it yet, right? Like you need to overcome it. You need to learn how to overcome it. Once you figure it out, it's easy. Everything in your life that is now easy was once hard, right? So I often say, change your relationship with hard because what's hard? How many of you think a diet is hard? Well, like, seriously, think about that. Is it hard to eat healthy, I don't know, well-grown organic foods that you get from a grocery store, you get to prepare to like the exact liking that you want? Is that hard? Oh, maybe different. It may be Un unusual for you, uncomfortable. Navy SEALs have it hard. People in, in, in wars have it hard. People in poverty have it hard. We don't have it hard, right? We're choosing these self-inflicted obstacles and your choice to put yourself in front of it should be conscious, intentional, and welcomed. Thank you. Give me some more, please. I can handle this, right? And And it's oftentimes the key to breaking through those um, repetitive barriers, right? Sometimes we keep running face first in the same wall. The repet the key to running through the repetitive barriers is becoming aware of when it happens. Because I know a lot of people don't uh, always become aware in the moment and go back to the same mindless repetitive pattern, right? So if you're someone who repeatedly, repeatedly goes back to, oh shit, I did that again. Like I cheated again on my diet or I forgot this. I didn't do that. It's a mindless repetitive pattern. That your, that your unconscious mind is inculcated that you're not even thinking about and you keep setting you back and setting you back and setting you back. So what's the key to overcoming it? Awareness. You got to become aware in the moment of when it happens. How to become aware in the moment when it happens. Well, this is what muscle intelligence training is literally based on, right? Intentionality behind your training, becoming present in the moment in exercise so that that 60 minutes or 90 minutes a day transfers into the rest of your life. It's the same thing as meditation, right? Why do we meditate? To focus our mind, to center on a single point and to learn to become present in the moment, right? As well as the huge long-term benefits of reorganizing your mind. Um, the reason we ultimately meditate is to become present in the moment. Ultimately, all of our body is linked, right? Uh, you can't separate the mind from the body. And sometimes we, we think of things in isolation, don't we? We think of our mental state as in some way being different than our physical state, our, our psychology and our physiology as being separate. When in reality, those two things are inextricably linked. My physiology determines my psychology and my psychology actually determines my physiology. It's a two-way street. And there's a lot of kind of debate back and forth, which one has a greater impact on which. I, I don't think you can, you can decipher it. I think it's, it's definitely a two-way street. And so as we become prepared or we want to prepare to eat, realizing that the state of our mind is very impactful to how our body receives food, how our body receives nutrients and energy from food. So be, be cognizant of that, right? You are not just what you eat. You are what your body does with what you eat. So eating food in a unhealthy, stressed 
state is a completely different experience than eating food in a very calm, relaxed, receiving type state, right? So my encouragement to each and every you guys, three to five, ideally 10 breaths. I mean, everyone can sit down and do 10 breaths before you eat. And, and every breath should be, in my opinion, progressively um, more, more calm, right? Maybe the exhale gets a little bit longer. Maybe the pauses at the ends get a little bit longer. It's almost like you're sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into a state of relaxation. So then, and you literally, and so before I eat every meal, I close my eyes and I'll breathe. And then I'll, in, in my mind's eye with my eyes closed, I'll envision this food and the energy of the food nourishing the cells of my body, right? And I'll try to get as in tune as I can with the, the food that I'm about to consume, where it came from, this animal that maybe gave its life for me, this plant that's going to nourish my body and ask my body to receive these nutrients well. And just the act of mindfulness around food, as much as it may sound weird to some of you guys, just the act of mindfulness around food, in my opinion, allows my body to receive food in a different way. It's just uh, e even if the actual practice of asking my body or my body to receive food isn't useful, perhaps it is, but even if it's not useful, the act of being mindful in that moment of just being present with just one thing, just my food and saying thank you to this food and thank you to my body, I have a strong belief there's, there's value to that. There's a book, if you guys are interested in this kind of stuff, that's actually really well grounded in science. He's pull, it's, it's all data driven called Mind to Matter, M A T T E R, Matter, with a Dawson Church. He's actually been a guest in the podcast. He's phenomenal. Uh, and he's actually, the books are, he does a really good job with his books. Like I was really, really blessed, felt very blessed when he came on the podcast. Yeah, he does a very, very good job. Mind to Matter. If you guys are interested in that kind of stuff and how to, how, your thoughts change your life, how your thoughts change your frequencies, change your outcomes. Mind to Matter is a really interesting book. And on that note, let's talk about some food. So as I say, if you would have talked to me six, five years ago, six years ago when I was a professional bodybuilder, I would have told you that I was neurotic about my food choices. I was neurotic about the quality of food that I ate. I was very meticulous. Uh, I weighed everything. I measured everything because I had an objective, right? I had an objective of being the best bodybuilder in the world, or at least the very best bodybuilder I could be. And to me, removing any uh, room for error, any uh, subjectivity was important. So that's the way I, I achieve consistent outcomes, right? So if I want to achieve a consistent outcome of looking a specific way, I'm very consistent and meticulous with the way I, I, I eat, the way I record, the way I eat, the way I prepare how I, how my food. So if you're somebody who's looking to achieve something that we'll say is world-class, right? If you're looking to achieve a world-class physique, then my suggestion is you take on a world-class standard and it doesn't need to be permanent, right? This is what I've proven to myself. It's like, I did that for 15 years. I was obsessed with food and I've proven to myself that that's not permanent. That's a, a, a state that maybe can become a trait. But now I've unwound it and I'm not psychologically attached to like, I don't even need to weigh anything anymore. I've weighed anything in six years, right? So I got away from the, you know, some people are afraid of like getting into the neurotic pattern. Well, if it's, if it's outcome-based, maybe it's useful. You know, was I obsessed with nutrition? Yep, probably. Was it a healthy obsession? Subjectively, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But it got me a great result. I'm not saying that you guys should, should become obsessed. What I'm saying is, the the mindset should match the outcome, the desired outcome. The mindset should match the goal. So if you're uh, willing to accept 80% of the results or 90% of the results, offer 80 or 90% of the commitment, but then be realistic with yourself and say, hey, I'm, I'm about 80% in with this nutrition. I'd say for myself, I'm probably 90% in for nutrition. I'm not, I'm not 100%. There's no way. Like I, I definitely have some, some wiggle room in my nutrition, but still 90% of the time, it's really, really great. And for me, that suits my lifestyle now. So you guys decide. So if your outcome is like, hey, in the next three months, six months, 12 months, I want to look like this, then my suggestion to you is you go closer to 100% than you are 90, right? Or maybe it's 95% or 98% or maybe 28 days of the month, you're 100% and then two days of the month, you're 80%. But have a, have a conversation with yourself around what that should look like, right? So we can design what 100% looks like for you. But we can also design what 90% looks like for you, right? Giving you 10% of wiggle room. Like, hey, that, that one day or that 10% of the time, do whatever you want. I'd say 80% of my clients get that. 
They get, you know, hey man, like the first four meals of the day or first three meals of the day, I need you to be pretty tight with this. And then maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday, if you're out with your wife, you get to have a glass of wine and dessert. I'm like, yeah, sweet. That's perfect. And they're still getting 80 or 90% of the results, right? But that's the realistic expectation. That's the conversation we have. If you guys want to have 100% of the results, then you have to be willing to make a sacrifice and say, hey, you know what, coach, for the next two months, I want to go all in on this. You know, I want to have 100% commitment, you know, 30 days of the month or 29 days of the month. Let's talk about that, right? These are all realistic things we can manage with you guys. So moving on from there, what does an ideal nutrition plan look like? Well, guess what? There is no such thing as an ideal nutrition plan ongoing, right? In my perspective, a nutrition plan is only optimal in, in as much as it matches your current circumstance and your current goal. So a, an ideal nutrition plan is an adaptive process. It's literally a living and breathing organism because you are, right? As your stress changes, as your sleep changes, as the seasons change, we should be adapting our nutrition based on what our body needs in the moment. And learning how to make those decisions can be complex. Actually, they're so much more simple than, than you think. Because there's, there's a small number of basic things your body kind of always needs. And there's a couple other things where you could probably go in any direction based on how hard you worked that day or how much stress you had that day or yeah, you're based on your hunger that day. You know what? Some days you're a little more hungry. Okay, eat a little more. Some days you're a little less hungry, eat a little less. As long as it, the, it balances out to the weekly calories being exactly where they're supposed to be. So, for example, if coach says, hey, you're supposed to eat 2,000 calories today. You're like, coach, I ate 2,100 today. No problem. Eat 19 tomorrow. Right. There's nothing to be stressed about. You still at a hundred percent. Right. So we just got to make sure that if you, that if you are tracking things, you acknowledge it's okay to have some wiggle room here and there. Right. That, that's, I mean, that's the way I believe we should approach it. You know, hundred percent accuracy does, does allow you to have a margin for life. Um, you're not competing in the Mr. or Mrs. Olympia, but it's, it's always being aware of like, yeah, I went over a little bit or a little under today. I'll make it up tomorrow. So what does our body need? On a day to day basis. First, as we said it right at the beginning, we want to start with this mindset of I am not what I eat. I am what I absorb. Therefore, my digestion is a really big thing. So I actually eat to support a healthy digestive tract. What does that mean? One, the state matters, but two, I'm, all, I'm often eating as many different types of fruits and vegetables as I can get my hands on more vegetables and fruits, probably 5% fruit, 95% vegetables as far as like how much I consume, small amount of fruit, huge amount of vegetables. Now, when I say huge amount, I don't mean um, like actual amount. I mean, huge amount of variety. So I, if, if I'm in a grocery store and there's a different type of vegetable, I'm going to get it. I'm going to try it and figure it out. I'm going to, you know, I may have never consume it again, but I, I'm going to try most vegetables because I feel it's a really good way to support diversity in the microbiome. And, and, you know, there's people in the, on the, in the world now talking about these anti-nutrients of vegetables, like oxalates, phytic acid. You guys have heard of those things? Um, we've heard of, um, what's Gundry? Oxalates. No, Gundry is not oxalates. Gundry is, um, why am I forgetting what Dr. Gundry talks about? I don't want to refresh my memory. Dr. Gundry talks about lectins. So it's lectins, phytates, and oxalates. Those are your three, what, what doctors or what internet people will say are, are anti-nutrients. So lectins, you guys have heard of lectins, phytates phytic acid, and oxalates. So oxalates are these crystallized structures that can actually cause kidney stones and joint pain. Lectins cause GI distress and can lead to leaky, lead to leaky gut. Phytic acid is an anti-nutrient, which can bind onto high quality nutrients and, and can I just pass it through the GI tract. Those things are real. But here's the thing. It's also very genetic and very dose dependent. So when you hear these guys preaching carnivores being the best thing in the world, it may very well be for them. Right. They may have a genetic predisposition to not do using those things well. They may have a weak GI tract. Um, or, or maybe they just in the past have had an experience with high amounts of these things. And there's some people who, you know, become a vegetarian and feel just terrible and they go on a carnivore and they feel amazing. And this would be an example of people who do this. There's, there's animal meat, animal products don't have these, what we'll call anti nutrients that are, you know, again, I don't want to make it sound like these vegetables are actually inherently bad because here's the catch. The things that they're calling bad are actually very useful as well. Why is that? Small amounts of these things can cause your body to adapt. Like, so if we talk, if we think of like something like, um, uh, sulforaphane or DIM or calcium deglucrate, you guys may not know what those are, but those are, uh, nutrients that come from, uh, plants 
that the way they act in the body is the body, they actually turn on the body's, um, so it causes upregulation of the internal systems because it is a toxin. So toxins aren't always inherently bad, like some of these guys are preaching. It actually can cause, so for example, sulforaphane, when you consume sulforaphane, it's in broccoli, it's, it's what we call an anti-estrogen. Um, when you consume sulforaphane, it actually asks the liver to upregulate its estrogen detoxification pathways, which is very useful. Right. So while they are saying they are incorrect in saying that, yes, these things are anti nutrients, they do have benefits in the right amount for the right people. I digress. That was a bit of a tangent. But getting back to what I really, the reason I really want to start that chat was, or that conversation is like the way you digest food is very important. So eat a wide array of, of vegetables, fermented foods, cabbage, kimchi, things like this are very important. I consume those pretty much with every meal, a small amount. There doesn't have to be a large amount, but a small amount for sure. I consume a lot of berries. I would suggest most people consume a lot of berries for the polyphenol. So while we're on the vegetable and, and, and fruit, fruit topic, uh, berries are certainly by far your most uh, advantageous and useful fruit because of the polyphenols being extremely useful for the brain, uh, brain and heart, cardiovascular health. Um, as far as vet, types of vegetables, a, a mix is very, very important. Cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, uh, cauliflower are great for detoxifying estrogens. So that's, that's one level of nutrition, right? Hit as many different diverse vegetables as you can. Second one, which usually I put first is one gram of protein per pound is important. Approximately, approximately, right? And sometimes is less and sometimes is more. And there's nothing inherently wrong with doing 1.5 grams per pound, which is a lot, but there's, there's no data that's ever been said it's, there's anything wrong with that, especially if you're trying to build muscle. Something wrong. The only thing that may come up if you're someone who's doing 1.5 grams is sometimes you get constipation. But although many carnivores have, have disproven that many, many times again, so you can consume 1.5 to 2 grams of protein. When I was pot bodybuilding, I consume up to 1.5 or 2 grams of protein per pound body weight. That's a lot of protein. But uh, it seemed like the more I did, the more I grew. Although I will admit, the more I consumed it, the more my digestion suffered. And so there's ways around that. If you feel like you're increasing your protein and maybe it's, it's quickly rather than slowly. So if you do it slowly, your body upregulates its ability to produce acids and enzymes so it can break down more over time, right? You literally have genetic upregulation of those, of those gene SNPs. Whereas if you're doing it quickly, you want to, you want to supplement with, with uh, betaine hydrochloride or digestive enzymes, proteolytic digestive enzymes to help with the breakdown of proteins. So digestive enzymes is something that I suggest for everyone. Um, everyone, because I mean, as I shouldn't say everyone, everyone over the age of 30, 35, they're just depends on because most of us are suffering from uh, uh, suboptimal digestion. We'll say one thing that's important to know, there's enzymes to import, to improve digestion, to cleanse the GI tract, to improve cardiovascular function, heart, heart function, to improve uh, muscle function, to improve joint function. There's an enzyme for all those things. I have most of them sitting on my counter right beside me. And uh, I use them all. Like I use, I use most, if not all of them, on a consistent basis. I vary, I vary it. But all right. So coming back to nutrition. So if if, if I were to go back and start over again, I, I did in this order on purpose. But there may be one thing that precedes both of these things in my mind, and it's first minimizing inflammation. And so if a food is is inflammatory to you, don't consume it. <laughs> Don't consume it. That, that should be like the first lens through which you make decisions. If, and, and again, I don't know what's inflammatory to you, right? I can give you general statements as to what's inflammatory, right? Sugar, very inflammatory. High fructose corn syrup, very inflammatory. Alcohol, fortunately, very inflammatory. Vegetable oils, very inflammatory. For most people, dairy. For most people, grains, gluten, soy, corn, right? All those things for most people are inflammatory. So we just take them out. So you guys are seeing a nutrition plan. Most of the time, we just, we just take those out. Why? Because in no way are they doing anything useful for you. So if you're consuming them, it's stri strictly because like, I just like them. Like, okay, but maybe you could like something else for a while. If you have a goal right now, right? I, I like the, my outcome of my goal but more than I like the short-term pleasure of eating uh, corn dog or something. Or corn, you know, pop, remove those things, take them out. There's no, no benefit for you. Oh yeah, nightshades are definitely inflammatory for many people as well. Matsu in there. So I'll say for me, like white potatoes, don't touch them. I don't touch them personally. Like there's some foods that I'm like, yeah, it just doesn't work for me. Chicken, to be honest, for many years, I kind of started reintroducing it, but for, for many years, chicken, I didn't touch it. It's like 
I could eat four ounces of chicken and feel like my stomach was bloated, but I could eat 16 ounces of beef and feel like a champion. So I'm like, all right, there's something, there's something wrong here, right? Something's going on. Yeah, everyone's different. I think based on genetics, based on history, there's a lot of different compiled factors. All right, so we went through inflammation, protein, vegetables. The other thing that I, I did say there with vegetables is polyphenols. I like to include that in general because polyphenols from things like, I'll go through the list of things that are polyphenols. Um, so berries, dark chocolate, coffee, olive oil, all these like seemingly you know, uh, ubiquitously healthy foods are very loaded with polyphenols, which are great for the brain, great for um, blood flow. So I would just make those kind of a staple. So if you guys haven't seen my document on how I eat or the 10 foods I suggest you eat, these are all there. And coming back to meat, we should maybe go a little bit deeper. So the closer the animal is to its like natural state where it, was, it would have naturally grazed and, and, and been raised, that's where you want to eat it, right? So it's wild meat. Top of the list is wild meat and wild fish. Follow that with like grass fed, grass finished, and then move down the list from there. And people always ask like, man, is, is it, does it make that much of a difference? The answer is it really, it really does. Like if you can afford to eat organic food, eat it. If you can afford to eat wild or grass fed, eat it. And if you can't, choose the leanest cut you can find because toxins are stored in the fats. So if you're going to eat like a ribeye or something like that, don't eat a, a grain fed, corn fed ribeye. Eat a grass fed ribeye. If you're going to get a, a steak that's grain fed or corn fed, get a tenderloin, get a sirloin, get something that's, that's less less fatty. The more in tune you become with your body, the more you'll just know. So I'll tell you what, the first thing I'd look for is lethargy. If you eat and you don't feel energized, that food's not good for you. So when we consume food, we're supposed to feel better, not worse, right? Now, some foods have other influences like serotonin increasers, but in general, we want to feel more energized. After food. If we feel less, we feel lethargic, we feel like our eyes are heavy. We feel like our nose is running and we're going to get like a little bit of a runny nose after eating. It's usually an indication of inflammation, um, brain fog, joint pain, stomach uh, indigestion, bloating, all those things like just general overall decrease in function of the body. Because your GI tract, remember, your GI tract is like, they call it, they're saying it's like the second brain, right? The, the stomach is like the second brain. So there's nerves. So if you picture like the stomach being this ball and these nerves that are inserted into the, into the entire outside of the perimeter of the ball. And they're perceiving what comes in. They're perceiving the amount of stretch. They're perceiving the types of food in there. And so they immediately know what's going on. They'll either energize you or take away from you. And so um, pay attention. Pay attention is the key. All right. So the final thing on the list, or actually two final things on the list, high quality fats. If you're going to invest in anything nutritionally, high quality meats and high quality fats should be staples in your life. Don't consume shitty fats. Just don't. Because they, they can come with toxins, they they get oxidized, they're just wreaking havoc in your body. So the top fats you should be consuming, in my opinion, always my opinion, and from the top down, is going to be olive oil at the top. I would put avocados and coconut oil second, um, animal products third, grass-fed organic animal products third. Occasionally, butter for some people. Butter is a very, very good fat. Butter is a short chain for glycerin, which means like instant energy if you tolerate um, diet dairy well. And nuts are kind of like a little further down the list. Nuts, I'm not the biggest fan of. They're okay. Uh, they're they're call it like a they're they're a B, right? Whereas avocado, olive oil, coconut oil, even even animal fat, those are A's. The animal fats, I'd say, is like an A minus because you don't want to overconsume saturated fat. Saturated fat is not bad. But it seems as though overconsuming too much of it may still have some challenges, especially if you're mixing with carbohydrate. Don't ever mix uh, saturated fat and carbohydrate. There's there's data on that being like basically the kiss of death. Um, yep, high MCT does fall into coconut oil, and again, again, ideally organic. I'm a big fan of MCT. Man, I use MCT every morning. You guys know that. Uh, huge fan of what it does for my brain. Makes my coffee taste delicious. Makes it fun. So uh, that's it for fats. Keep it really simple. And eliminate all the other things, canola, soy, safflower, sunflower, all that stuff. Just don't consume it. I, I literally, want, I think I've said this before, when I go to restaurants, <laughs> I get, do, any allergies? Yes. I'm allergic to corn, soy, and dairy. <laughs> I'm like, mm, that's true. I'm like, hey, you can't, I can't have that. I'm like, do you guys have olive oil? I'm like, no. I'm like, I don't want any oil. Just steam my stuff.
So, and even if they say that at all, well, usually it's cut with something else. And so the final thing that I'll say is carbohydrates, earn your carbohydrates, right? Earn your carbohydrates. And so I've been, I've been doing a lot of self-experimenting lately. I got my, my CGM on, continuous glucose monitor, and seeing what actually spikes glucose and what doesn't, and seeing how much I can consume without massively sponsoring or, or uh, spiking my glucose. It's been interesting to see how I can impact my glucose with just a little bit of movement or combining different foods in different ways. And so find the foods that make you feel great. Don't overconsume them. Try to eat them around movement. If you're eating carbohydrates when you're sitting on your butt, it's never a good idea. Thanks for listening to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. For full episode guides with important takeaways and bonus resources, head over to muscleintelligence.com slash learn. If you enjoy the show and find value in the content, please subscribe, share this podcast with at least one person you know and love who would benefit from this content, leave us a review, and support our sponsors. You can see the full list of show sponsors, discounts, and get exclusive Muscle Intelligence deals at muscleintelligence.com slash resources. To join our private community and get VIP access to my master classes, upcoming muscle camps, and other resources that we don't post anywhere else, head to muscleintelligence.com slash community. Most of all, thank you very much for your trust, for your time, and most importantly, for supporting health and fitness in this world. Enjoy your day. and I look forward to seeing you here next week. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.